everyone. Thanks for coming out. So I'm one of these terrible people who's disorganized who had to load my presentation. So uh, I don't know if you see all these things on the internet. I, I always see these headlines, 10 things you need to know to be successful, et cetera. So I thought I'd give it a try and, and give a bit of a, a catchy title to my presentation. Three things you need to know about drones. Um, <clears throat> so these are three things that we've kind of experienced over the last couple of years at Drone Deploy. And I thought I'd share them and see some responses from the audience. I'd love to have a chat afterwards to see if people agree with me, disagree with me. And uh, yeah, let's see how this future pans out. The first one I wanted to talk about was the, what we call the dirty little secret of drones. Whenever we see these uh, fantastic promotional videos, we always see a man who gets a drone, takes it out the box, magically it's flying. And then uh, in a couple of seconds, there's this fantastic data product that they're showing off. And there's this, this like, look at what's possible. We can do all these incredible things. But what we call the dirty little secret is that little arrow in between the two. What, what does it really take to get from point A to point B? Um, how do we go from drone to data? So looking at what the, the reality really is, um, the example of that little Trimble uh, drone that you saw up there, when you, when you buy that, you have the option of getting the four-day training program in Belgium. Um, that's, that's a pretty hefty, significant in, like, uh, investment of both time and energy and money. There's, there's this huge amount of training that's required to understand how these vehicles operate and how they work. And you know, this doesn't even include uh, what's required in terms of understanding the software packages and all these different bits and pieces you have to navigate to get from A to B. The other thing that no one really talks about is what happens after the flight. There's generally this four to 24 hour process of converting the imagery captured from the vehicle and turning it into the data product that you see at the other end. You generally need some photogrammatic training. You have to have a, a very big computer to do this data processing. There are SD cards, USB cables, log files. There's a huge amount of time and commitment and expertise required in order to get from drone to data. <clears throat> and that's that's just not really sustainable in, in terms of producing this return on investment. If we want farmers or if we want people to, to really get use out of these unmanned systems, we've got to turn that difficult into the simple. And we have to turn that slow into the fast. And this is really what we see as the big future of drones. It's like, how do we, how do we reduce this complexity? How do we make it really simple and fast to get from point A to point B? And so, what we see as the, the end state is, is taking those 50 odd steps that you had to go through before. And I mean, I, I don't know what, what other people's experiences are, but oftentimes when you're going out into the field, even setting up the drone itself and the GCS and all the rest, that takes sometimes longer than the flight itself. Um, so how do we convert all of these steps, both in the hardware and the software and, and all of the processing and information movement in between to just really simplify it? We, we need farmers to be able to make multiple maps in a day. And the, the act of going out there and collecting the data it can't come with the overhead of dozens of hours of processing and, and fiddling with data and trying to manage that. And the end result that they have needs to be easily digestible. And when we do reach this level of simplicity, suddenly drones become this really accessible tool. And anyone can pick it up and start making use of it and start really leveraging the value that it can provide to the, to the industry. Um, I, I think like a great example is the Roomba. You know, I have one of these at home and it's incredible. You put it down, you press clean, and it cleans. And we need to get to the same level of that simplicity just to really make getting this aerial data as easy as possible. Uh, so let's see if this, oh. All right. That didn't work. I try to put a video in here, and it doesn't seem to like it. Uh. So this is what we've kind of been working on, is how can we simplify it so that you switch on your drone, you take out the device you already have in your pocket, you say, this is the area I want to make a map of, you press the go button in the bottom corner. You say, all right, it all checks out. I want to take off. You press that take off button. And there the drone is. It takes off. It flies off into the distance. It captures all the imagery. All that imagery is uploaded to the cloud. It's all processed. And while you're there, within minutes, 
you actually have access to this fantastic data set. So here it is, Manu just kind of went out there and flew in a vineyard, and within a couple of minutes, he's able to digest this information and start looking at you know, interesting aspects, looking at the 3D models, looking at uh, all the other data products that we can generate. So the, the second thing that I think is very interesting to comment on is that it's not the drone that matters. And now, this is a bit of a strange statement. Uh, we've been trained deeply to care about the drone. Uh, frankly, I think they're awesome. Flying robots are amazing. I still feel this, this incredible thrill when this machine just takes off and goes off and does this bidding that, that I kind of commanded it to do. But the, the exciting thing, like what makes it a drone as, as part to like the hobbyist and, and uh, the excitement of flight is that we send it off to do this bidding. And, and what is that bidding? The, the purpose that we have these vehicles today in industry, it's all about collecting the data. You know, we started off trying to get drones to fly, and it's incredible that we can. Those problems have been solved as time has gone on. We're, we're able to very cheaply and easily, through the, the fantastic innovations of hardware manufacturers and autopilot creators and programmers around the world, we can get these machines to take off and do our bidding. But it's, it's now it's about what we get from that. And it's about the sensor that we have, the quality of the data that we can get, being able to process this information that we're getting back and, and, and generate useful data out of it, and being able to ground truth that data out there in the field. Um, Ian Butler hit the nail on the head. He wrote a great blog post a couple months ago entitled, It's Not About the Drone, It's About the Data. But what I'd like to challenge everyone now on is saying that it's actually not about the data. It's about the information. I don't know how many commercial use cases can be solved by just having a 3D model or having an automosaic. You know, these, these pictures are a huge step in, in understanding the world around us, and having this digital imagery is like a fantastic way to digest and make sense of and compare across time, et cetera. But where we need to get to as an industry is not maps, but measurements, volumes, growth maps, the types of information that's, that's actionable, where you can look at it and you can say, all right, I can make decisions, I've equipped my business to move forward and generate value. So we're working with a bunch of people in the industry to expand this envelope that we already have. And I'd really love to chat to anyone who, who does have this information locked in their head that they would love to just share it and say, how can I mechanize? How can I scale this? How can I make it so that when I press the go button, or when I press the clean button on my Roomba, it knows how to clean my room for my industry, for my business? The other thing that I think is, uh, is quite an interesting one is size matters. Uh, <laughs> We all love the idea of these you know, big, incredible machines that fly out there. But what we've learned by going out into the industry and working with people is that we really need to get smaller. Uh, when you look at a smaller vehicle, one of the most impressive things is the reduced risk. So this was a, <laughs> a test by some Danish guys where they basically tried to fly an EB into themselves. And here's this guy jumping, headbutting this thing, and he's just fine, right? When, when you have a vehicle that's got less kinetic energy than a Frisbee, that drastically reduces the risk. And what we're trying to do in, in industry is put these things to work for our businesses. And if you want something to fly over construction site, to fly over people, you know, obviously we need to work really hard on the engineering side in order to make sure that these things don't crash, but bad things happen, right? There's always gonna be these unforeseen circumstances. What we need to do is try and miniaturize the technology so that if something bad does happen, it's actually not that big a deal. He's able to sit there with the, the gymnast pose at the end there. When we compare it to, to kind of like a much bigger vehicle, uh, when, when things go bad here, it's a terrifying affair. And I'm sure a bunch of us have experienced this. Uh, there are hubcaps, there are scratches, there are dents, there's broken glass. There, there are a whole bunch of things that, that have gone horribly wrong. And fortunately, this was into a, an, like an unoccupied park car. Um, it's, the other thing that's also quite incredible is because the vehicle itself has so little kinetic energy in the EV, you're able to pretty much just pick it up and fly it again. Whereas that guy is gonna have to have some serious work and effort to, to get it back up in the air. The other thing that's quite interesting is that smaller is oftentimes also simpler. If you can just have a backpack and you can just throw your drone in there 
and there, there are no moving parts. You basically just spin on some rotors and it's ready to take off versus you know, all of those connectors that have a, a limited lifespan of the number of times you can connect it. Uh, maybe you forget to connect it one time. Um, all of the nuts and bolts and hinges. The more stuff that there is, the more stuff there is to potentially forget or to break or another point of failure. And so by miniaturizing these things as well, we reduce the need to actually be able to take them apart. And we can just have this single unit that can solve the, prog the problem as, as the single entity. And uh, we feel very strongly about that as well with the, the whole GCS and, and operations and control side of things. Um, we used to have you know, big antennas and radios and cables. And uh, I'd say probably one in five times we went out, we used to forget something. And then we, we almost couldn't do something we'd have to hack it together with duct tape and super glue, as we tend to do. If the operating system and the control that you have is just the smartphone you already have in your pocket that you're never going to leave behind because it's got your Facebook and Snapchat and whatever else that, that keeps you connected to the world, uh, all you've got to do is just open this app, and suddenly you can, you can start controlling and making sense and digesting this data and ground truthing and all the other important, powerful things that you have to do. There's also, you know, in, in terms of the public opinion, there's a drastically reduced... Uh, amount of fear. The smaller something is, you know, the cuter it is, and the friendlier it is, and the less dangerous. And, and there are a whole number of different things that would just make this technology a lot easier to digest and accept if it were just smaller and simpler. Um, I, know, I know what everyone else is going to say to me is, is that, well, as soon as you miniaturize these things, you're going to lose a lot of the capabilities. Uh, but I thought I'd take a, a quick look to nature to kind of show you what we're working with. Uh, I polled a bunch of different birds and had a look at you know, who are the record breakers in a bunch of different industries in terms of like, the bird space. And we have the Arctic tern. Uh, this weighs 86 grams, or for those of you who have not yet matured to a good measurement system, three ounces. Uh, it's a really, really short wingspan and is able to fly 90,000 kilometers there and back every year. It's this incredible feat of the longest migration of any known living thing is this small, lightweight bird. The peregrine falcon is also super light, similar type wingspan. It's the fastest bird known to man. It's also got uh, the best eyesight. And the bar-tailed godwit is incredible. I learned about this one actually making this talk. Uh, this 190-gram bird with also, again, very small wingspan can fly 11,500 kilometers in a single flight. It will take off, it will fly 11,500 kilometers in about nine days, and then we'll land, uh, which, is, which is unbelievable. <clears throat> Looking at what we're having in our space, we're getting there. Looking at what we used to have, I guess, in uh, 2012 versus 2014 versus 2015, and having similar capabilities of being able to create 4K video with rectilinear lenses, and, and all of these incredible feats of technology, you now have a smaller vehicle that has a longer flight time and actually has a, a more capable uh, sensor payload and accessories. Um, so these are three lessons that, that I've learned over the last couple of years. Uh, I'd love to chat with people about them and spitball some other new interesting ones. And if anyone wants to reach out to me, that's, that's my information. Um, I tried to keep it very brief because I thought we'd be running behind. I don't actually even know if the next speaker is ready. Uh, but yeah, I guess if, if Pat's not here to move along, I'm happy to take a question or two. We got one. So what we have with the, that DJI product there is the phone is relaying the information back up to the web after the flight, and it probably takes around 10 minutes to get the, the like, auto mosaic and, and the 3D models. With the other products that we're working with, we have the drones actually got an LTE modem, and it's, it's a physical extension of the internet. And the drone itself broadcasts that data up. We have that in real time. So before it even lands, you have your auto mosaic, and we have farmers in, in about 15 states using that to, with NDVI cameras to be able to start ground truthing the data while the drone's still busy flying. So there's absolutely zero waste of time. You plug it in, switch it on, fly it, and start making sense. Looks like Pat's scrambling to find the next person. <laughs> if 
Thank you, Mr. Rod.